Welcome to Rosie Presents. I am so excited to be here with you all. Um, we have a wonderful crowd and we have very special people here in the audience. I think you're in for a treat today. Um, I am so pleased for the opportunity to introduce, to introduce you to San Francisco BATCO, which is the Bay Area Theater Company. My name is Sarah Pritchard. I'm the executive director of Rosie the Riveter Trust. And we have been having so much fun hanging out, getting to know SF Badco and planning this wonderful event for you. So, but first I want to, I have a cup, I have a little bragging right to do. And that is that this is an evening about our beautiful Betty Reed Soskin. And this is a little Polaroid that was taken the day she retired from the National Park Service. Um, I'm also very happy to don a sticker we are all making history. And this is a, a quote from Betty because Betty has an amazing, you know, many, many quotes. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit about what our program is today. We are, first we're gonna start off with a trailer of the musical that we are going to be talking about tonight with our wonderful guest. Um, we are then gonna be in conversation with Elizabeth and Michael. And then we're gonna zoom into the rehearsal studio and see what's going on there, meet some of the characters, uh, take some questions and, um, and you know we have answers for you, hopefully. Um, and then we're gonna end with a, a trailer of the forthcoming documentary, the film, which is also as the same name of the musical, Sign My Name to Freedom. Um, so that's going to round off our night. We've got a lot of uh, events coming up. We'll tell you about them at the end. But without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce the trailer for the musical. So just hold on tight. I have been so many women so many different times. I've been a daughter, a mother, a businesswoman, a federal worker. I was 85 before I became a park ranger. I retired at a hundred. I've actually been so many things that's hard to remember. I never really dreamed that there were so many parts to me. I don't think I'll be remembered as a park ranger. I want to be remembered as Betty. My name is Betty, and this is my brief but spectacular take on signing my name to freedom. Freedom. Beautiful. Well, I couldn't be more excited to introduce you to Michael Jean Sullivan, the playwright, and Elizabeth Carter, the director. Hello. How are you guys? Great. Wonderful. So Good to talk to, to you. <laughs> well, okay. I'm not doing an introduction because what I want to do is within the questions, when you have a question, feel free to riff and give us a little bit about your rich backgrounds that you have and your connections. And I'd like to start off, I'll start off with you, Michael. Can you tell me about your relationship with Betty? Which is a very open question. We can go on for hours, but just to synthesize it, just so that so that people in the audience know where you're coming from and um and why you 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 took on writing a musical about Betty. Well, interesting. Yeah, well, I'm I do write uh, musicals, don't write the lyrics, don't write the music, but I do write very political plays. That's a, that's what I do is I write political musical comedies and uh, uh, some plays that are dram very dramatic, but always shows that are trying to activate the audience in some way. And so I had a show that was running uh, that I'd written uh, that was running at SF Playhouse. And while it was running, I was in rehearsal in a show at SF Playhouse. And one of the other actors in the show was Jamie Z. And Jamie came up to me one day. She saw my the show that I had running, uh, The Great Con, that had just closed. Oh, she saw it while it was running. And after it closed, she said, well, I'm working on this other project. And, you know, she was very passionate about it. And she'd met B Betty and she talked to Betty and she loved her. And she really wanted to showcase her music. But she was like, I'd really like to make it into a play. Would you be interested in writing the script for the play? And I was like, well, that sounds daunting. But let me see. And so uh, I bought the book. I, you know, I studied up on Betty. I already knew about her, but I'd never met her. I read the book, uh, signed my name to freedom. And then I met Betty and I talked to her. You know, we did a, uh, an interview for a couple of hours, actually. And I told her 
you know, what I wanted to do, my, my, the first ideas that I had and the importance of the impact that a show should have on an audience and how important her, I thought her life was and what I would do with it. And she was like, okay. And so uh, uh, then I thought about it more until I had an idea when I had the idea of how to do it. Then I got in touch with Rodney uh, Earl Jackson at SF Batco and Jamie and said, yes, I want to write this play. Wow. Very, very cool. How about you, Elizabeth? What is your connection to Betty? And Well, you know, I remember reading um, about Betty and I remember seeing her on, you know, on the news like everybody else. Um, and but then it wasn't until Rodney reached out to me and said, hey, we really need somebody who can see the full scope of this play. I, I know Michael um, as well outside of that, but it was Rodney Earl Jackson, the artistic director here at SF Batco that reached out to me and said, what do you think of this? Read it. And could you do this? And by the way, there's Ariel. And by the way, there are eight dancers. And by the way, it's a musical. And I said, okay. Um, uh, and I had just come back from uh, St. Louis Rep, where I had been directing um, a Dominique Morisot play. And so it was very exciting to me, but I also was like, okay, a little daunted. And then I said, yes, because I like to do things that scare me. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't. Okay. So there was a jump. You started writing, Michael, um, a play, but then you have a background at San Francisco Mind Troop. Is this, so are your plays all musicals or was there, did you go in straight with a play and then it turned into a musical when you found out hmm. the rich, the richness of Betty and her songwriting and singing? Well, the Mind Troop shows are all musicals. You know, we, we're doing political musical concerts. We don't do silent mime. It's just like a Broadway play, only it has a point. Uh, and with when Jamie approached me about the show about Betty, she was really coming from the musical aspect. Okay. She was like, Betty has all of these songs and she wanted to really, she'd already created a smaller piece that was a showcase of the songs. Mm -hmm. And so when I read the script, the, the challenge, like with the regular musical, you know, you write the book, somebody comes along and uh, you work with a composer lyricist and they write songs, they take pieces of the script and they make it into songs. Where can we forward the plot? Where can we expand it emotionally and musically? Whereas with this script, I went through all of the songs that Betty already had and had to try to find a way to make them forward the plot rather than everything coming to a stop and they're just being a song. Is that each time I wanted to put them in a way so that we learn more about her character, we learn more about what's going on in the world at that point and mm -hmm. why she's changing and how she's changing. So that was really a very different challenge uh, to me and I think probably to any playwright really. Wow, that's, that's great. That's interesting. Elizabeth, here's a quote. We are a sum of all the people we have been. And that's one of Betty's, you know, very familiar quotes. We are the sum of all people we have been. Can you describe your creative process and a glimpse of what it's like working with four different actors who represent different, different chapters and life stages? You know, the thing about this play that actually really excited me about um, this piece was actually that piece, because I actually really resonate with that, <laughs> that I feel like I have all these different aspects of myself. I'm a parent. I'm um, an artist. Um, I'm very, I love to play. I'm um, a visual artist as well. And so like, there, you know, there's all these different ways that we, I imagine what I might also do in the future. Um I'm sentimental, but I'm also tough. Like there's all these different aspects. We all have these, right? And I just love that we are sort of an accumulation of the, the sometimes the stages of our life, but sometimes the um, expression of our life, right? And so the thing that actually really excited me about what Michael wrote was that we were looking at sort of a fragmented Betty and finding a way through to express the fullness of her, but also to express that inter that way of looking back at yourself and all the pieces that you are, and then pulling how you pull yourself sort of together in those moments as well. And so it was that pulling together that, and that way that Betty looks back at herself 
that was actually the most like true kernel of the of the piece that I was really excited to dive into because I felt very akin to that myself. And when you, so I know there's elements in, in the play, which is dance and sort of aerial um, gymnastics, if you, if you will. And did you, um, did you spend time with Betty and were these things that kind of came, kind of rose up, came up in terms of like, um, you know, brought, brought these I ideas in or, or is this something that you've, you've used in the past? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, actually, when I came onto the project, some other development, because Jamie had been working on this piece for a while or just uh, conceptualizing it for a while. And one of the things is that Betty loves Ariel. And so Betty had worked with Joanna Haygood, Haygood um, before um, and famously, I guess, was on a trapeze in the middle of uh, Grace Cathedral. Um mm -hmm at one point in her life. And so she had a, a love of that. So when I was, um, when I first had these conversations about the play, I was told, oh, there's gonna be Ariel and there's gonna be these dancers. And I thought, okay, how do I pull all these things together? And then what was exciting is actually I realized why they were all in there. They were all things that were really integral to who Betty is. And so it's not just her music, it's like the way she, um, the things that she loved uh, that she loves and also how she feels um a sense of i think expression and and freedom in that so then like it's my the world, you know yeah like, how she the world. like i'm interested in this i love this let me pull this and let me pull this piece in and let me pull this piece in and then i realized also that um and then it was my job to be tasked with like how do those pieces serve the vision and integrate and so that's what I got really excited about. It's like, oh, this moment, yes, this makes sense. Oh, this moment, you know. And so for me, the puzzle pieces are fun because it's tying all of those things that were are important to her and that and how they serve the story. Wow, thank you. Michael, why is this a story we need to hear? Um, and, and I just, when, when we talked, we, I, I had the pleasure of speaking with both Michael and Elizabeth the other day. And I think that you said some pretty, um, very, something that really resonated with me, which is that, that Betty's life is representative of political changes decade, by, decade by decade, and that she's not an icon, but in fact, she's one of us. It was something like that. And it resonated. I just wanted you to expand, expand on that because this is an opportunity to see to see Betty where we may not have known there were such facets of her life. Yeah, well, that uh, uh, when I said before that I got together with Betty the first time I met her and we talked, and since then I've interviewed her different times, but one of the most important things that I told her was that this show wasn't going to be a tribute to her. I was not going to write a tribute to her because that could put her up on a pedestal and she becomes some, someone to admire and someone to look up to, but we then don't see her as one of us. And her life is very much our a very ex American experience going from, you know, uh, 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 a Southern city, going from New Orleans during the time of Jim Crow, during, during the time of, of, you know, still post Civil War, of course, but still very segregated and race being a daily thing, you know, in a way of, of how the, the black community is separated, let alone how the white community is separated from the black community. And so starting there and moving through the Great Depression, through the periods where uh, race and class, how they interact, how they become something that people are dealing with on a greater and greater level till we get to World War II. And then this idea that the whole country comes together, but does it? Because race and, and class are still an issue. You know, the army is still segregated. The Navy is still segregated. Each one of these things that through the history of uh, the, most of the 20th century and up until now, we're still dealing with these issues. And when I'm writing plays, I always feel very strongly that the play ultimately is about the audience. Mm -hmm. It has to connect to them. It has to be about them. The goal of the, any play is to change the audience. And how you do that, how, what story you tell, who you are showing on stage and what those relationships are, are just ways for the audience to reinterpret the world that they're in. Mm. And so fortunately, the songs that Betty 
uh, has written are so evocative of so much change, so much of what she was going through, what the country was going through, what she was going through as a as a black American, what she was going through as an American, what she was going through as a woman, and what she was going through as black American woman. You know, each one of those aspects, what she goes through as a mother and as a wife, as a business owner, all of these different things that an audience in general can relate to, not just people, you know, sometimes people see plays because they want to see themselves specifically on stage. And Betty has been so many people that any audience member could come and see the show and see themselves from being a small child to being retired. Uh, and living an, an honest and uh, uh, loud, in many ways, an expressive life. Yes, beautiful, meaningful, purposeful, you know, 85, putting on a uniform and being a park ranger and not stopping until you're 100. And today, Betty is 102 and still speaking mm -hmm. eloquently. It's amazing. Thank yeah. you. Um, so Elizabeth, you as a director, I want you to paint the scene a little bit for us about what it's like to produce, you know, work with four characters that are different ages and, you know, are represented. And how do you, how are you, what are some ways that you get the characters to gel together? So um, they look different, they act different, and yet they're representing one person how has that experience been? And maybe what were some some parts that were just challenging? And, and then what has been the flow? You guys are opening up March 29th. You're, you're in the flow for sure. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the things that's always challenging is when you're um, directing something that is a living person, right? A lot of times plays are done about people who have long passed. Um, and so it was important for me to meet Betty. So I, we, all of us actually came together, all of the actors, myself, um, came together and, and, um, visited Betty and just to get a sense of her, to ask her questions. We, since we had the script, we were now could like, you know, ask her, I mean, one of the things that I thought was, um, so funny to me was I asked Betty, I said, what's your favorite? I know it sounds silly, but I asked her, what's your favorite color? Because we all have like little, you know, really personal things. And she said, huh, I don't know. I don't know that I have a favorite color, you know, it, it depends on the season. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Betty is very much in the moment. And one of the things as, as I was sort of casting people, one, we wanted to make sure their voices worked well together. So that was an important factor um, so that they all could sound like they meshed together, but could have differences. Um, uh, Betty is, you know, was uh, born in his Creole and black. And so there's a certain um, necessity for like a certain kind of a little bit, but not to lean on like having to look exactly like Betty, but needing to look like they spanned at least in the same, um, you know, something akin to a look that they could be, you know, in the same world together. So that's one thing. But then the fun has been actually, I I've worked with a couple of the actors before and other ones not ever before. So is having us all in the room together, laughing, playing music. Um, sometimes on our break, we play dream girls. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and, and sharing food is a way that we build camaraderie um, and connection. And then everyone in there is really a pro um, and, and ask really great questions. And so for me, what it is, is building a really safe room so we can have difficult discussions because this play where it has some, has great humor, Michael's wonderful at writing some really funny stuff, funny moments. It also has really important historical moments in it that are very hard, you know, that, or that feel like they, re they, they kind of get inside of us and we remember things. Um, I remember moments through history because Betty is 102 and that is a long life. So one of the things we've all um, are leaning into is that Betty has an amazing sense of being in the present moment and a curiosity about things and a, a wonder. And so 
we, as we question and we, and we look at um, moments in the play moments in her life, it, it feels like she suddenly arrived and was in a moment where something met her like business, being a businesswoman came to her. She didn't say, I want to go and be a businesswoman. The moment came to her and she stepped into it. And yeah, she's again in, and again and again, that I does feel it. like a repeat of as we understand her and as we see her, you're right. Yes. Everything is a moment of meeting a moment. Oh, they need someone to speak up about this. I am here. I'm going to say this thing. And now everyone's looking at me and I'm like, I guess I'm here. I guess I'm supposed to be the spokesperson for this, you know, I, and then I'm going to run with it you know, and I'm going to go help city council and I'm going to clean up my street and I'm going to become a park ranger. You know, if she didn't say, I want to become a park ranger, right. she said, I see something that isn't quite right. I see something that is important to me. I want to speak up about it. And somebody said, I want to hear more about it. And then all of a sudden she was, a, I think things happened to Betty that way. Oh, I'm a park mm -hmm. ranger now. I didn't ever see that for my life. So it's a great wondrous journey that she's on. And so we keep leaning into like the, the wonder and the play of it and allow the moments that are hard to like mm -hmm. dig in and, and to let us settle together. So we have each other. Yeah. That I, I definitely feel, so So the trust was part of producing a documentary about her life stepping into the role as a ranger. And now we get to, you know, kind of uncover with the musical and the upcoming um, documentary, you know, this whole world that she put away in her closet for a long time with this, the songs um, that she written and, and performed. And this is just a special opportunity. Um, Michael, I wanted to ask you, um, throughout your research and conversations with Betty, what most surprised you about her life um, or who she is as a person? And Elizabeth kind of just gave her two cents of what she feels. And I'd love to hear from your side how, how you feel. Well, something that uh, Elizabeth said, that, that the idea of um, really an examined life, you know, is kind of rare, you know? That to have someone who actually isn't, they are both in the wonder and in the moment, but at the same time, they kind of understand the importance of those moments. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are swept along. Most of us are swept along in the, in the stream of our lives. And it's not until much later that we look back at that time and go, oh, I remember when I was in high school or college and that was important. But Betty seemed by, by always being in the moment and, by filling the void that's needed in that time, she always is being active rather than just, you know, letting things happen to her. And also understanding in those times and going, this, what I'm doing right now is the thing that needs to be done. Tomorrow, something else might need to be done. Yesterday, something else needed to be done. But right now, uh, you know, seeing, uh, finding need and filling it in a way, both spiritually, emotionally, economically, socially. Um, and that's a great lesson, I think, for everyone to, to not judge. There's a difference between being aware of what's going on in your lives and judging it and thinking that you're, you failed somehow. Somehow you didn't do enough. Oh, I'm not good enough to do this. So I, I shouldn't put my hand up at this moment because who's going to listen to me? as opposed to someone like Betty who puts her hand up because my opinion and voice is just as important as anyone else's. But even more than that, I have something important to say. The thing I need to say is the thing that's being unsaid right now. It's not about me. It is about the point. It is about the fact. It is about the moment of the thing happening. And that validation, I think for everyone to see someone who it doesn't have to be rich and famous. They don't have to be a Marvel superhero. They're just, you know, going through their life, seeing issues, problems, questions, and always questioning and looking for answers, uh, hopefully to make things better. Well, courageous is the word that comes up for yes. me when you're talking. And that is not, um, I don't think that that is, I think that's a very, that's a specialty amongst mm. us humans these days to be able to, you know, 
feel feel I don't I don't think she felt confident every time but she she's courageous in the fact that she does say well wait a minute and she does question or she says this is not feeling right or this the story that you are you know purveying or or um it do, does not resonate with me this is just my my thing well i think that's very that's not ordinary do you have no. what is your insights like have you met other characters like this or do you know other people like this or or what's your sense of how did Betty come to have this characteristic of being courageous and being a truth teller in a way that doesn't make, I find it's very, um, it just breaks in down barriers instead of putting up barriers when she's telling the truth. I think it's a very special trait. Well, I think part of it is her family, you know, the story about how her family had to leave uh, New Orleans because her father had the temerity to call a white man by his name, you know, and that the family had prestige and pride and a sense of uh, a sense of themselves and their place in the universe in a way of doing what was necessary in any moment, doing what is uh, uh what is going to be required culturally, what's going to be required in society, how they fit in rather than not thinking of themselves lesser than, not thinking of themselves better than, you know, but thinking of themselves as what we have to do. Now, of course, because they were Creole, there was, you know, looksism and colorism and things like that, that they brought into their lives, but that Betty look, also looked beyond that in a way that her parents couldn't mm. and didn't is also really important. And I think part of that is because she moved from New Orleans, from Creole New Orleans to Oakland in a completely different society, dealing with a broader spectrum of folks, you know, going to public school, seeing all of these people and seeing even the places where her parents had made, um, had had some prejudices. Mm. That having the variety, the self-confidence, but also just the questioning. And that is something that all of us can do. All of us in a moment where we see something wrong to so somebody is, is saying something that is exceptionally prejudiced or saying something biased or being sexist or transphobic or a xenophobic or anything. And you know, it's wrong, but there's that part of us that says, I'm not a big enough person to say anything. I'm not a big enough. I'm not important enough. My opinion doesn't matter. And Betty has not let that stop her in any moment. She just, this is just the thing that needs to be done. This is what needs to be said. This is the action that needs to be taken. Someone should do it. I'll do it. You know, can I add something there? This is something that I that I recently listened to when I was um that also Betty said that she made it a point in her that she would not speak against her values. Mm. It wasn't that she wasn't scared. She she talks about in, in her book a, a protest at the port of Oakland. And being terrified on the side of the road because the trucks were going by so fast and she'd never been to a protest before. And it was terrifying to her and she left. And then she came back. Right. And though she was scared and she did things like that over and over again when she was actually afraid. That's what's courageous. Mm. That's courage. Courage is not doing something that you're not afraid to do. Courage is doing something that you're a little afraid to do. And you do it anyway. And yeah. then also this piece about not speaking against her values. So that 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 piece, um, what is it? The four agreements of like being impeccable with your word. Um, you mm. know, that there is something about um, saying when you speak about things to not kind of going against yourself, even if you have to take a minute to think about what you actually believe or what's in, and that might change over time, but at the time she was true to her thinking and true to her values at every moment. And as things, the world changed and as things opened up and as she learned more things and was like, you know, as, as black Americans, a lot of things were not taught to us. We're not, we're kept from us um, or information or we're just not accessible. Like no one, you know, was talking about some of the things and then you learn them over time and you, your perspective on the world changes, right? And so as she learned more and more things and went through more and more experiences, those things might've shifted and she learned and she reflects, she's reflective. So she's not in the past, but she's reflective on what's happening and seeing how it, connects to other things in the world. 
And then that's not speaking against her values, I think is really a huge piece of what makes her very courageous. Yeah, it's, it to me, it reminds me of she trusts her intuition as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. So that she, because I, I think that she, I see her as, it's not, maybe you take a, you know, you take a beat, but she doesn't take too, too much time in order to sort of, to say, you know, her two cents and, and how she feels. And I think you need to have a strong sense of your trusting and your um, intuition to do that. Um, I, okay, so you guys live and breathe, you eat, live, breathe in the theater world and then the musical world and stuff. And not everyone does. And I think that also, um, it's a little bit different, you know, post COVID, we all sort of went and hibernated for a while and we're still kind of coming back. Can you, um, let us know, just break it down for us. Like how, how long is the play? What is the theater? Like, I want people to feel welcome. This is, this is a musical I want everyone that can to see. And I know that you will have streaming opportunities for people that are dialing in from the East Coast and the middle of the States and up and down and across the world. And that's fantastic. And then, but for the people that are living in the Bay Area, I want them to feel like they are they are welcome. And I think that the price point on the tickets is phenomenal. And we, we have a special code to, uh, give our, our rosy community. Um, but can you just let us know a little bit so that people just say like, yeah, you know what? I am going to prioritize this and I'm going to come and see this play. Hmm. <laughs> That's well, a question for theater in general, yeah. you know, that yeah. idea of, because theater for me, theater is the place where we can talk to each other, where we look for answers for the big questions in our society. You know, you can't do that with film because film is there, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. You know, they're more interested in getting your ticket than telling you the truth about anything. Um, You know, television is also uh, can be very manipulative and very, you know, and it's created with money and commercial in mind. Whereas theater is like coming to the commons. It's Mm -hmm. coming to the, the, the square at the middle of town and seeing someone who's putting on something that's trying to explain the questions that you have in life. And with a show like this, it is how do you kind of live a complete life to live a fulfilling life with your family, with your friends, with your community, um, to be both of service to others, but always be true to yourself. You know, these are questions, especially now, especially now when we are surrounded with so much selfishness and so much greed and so much self-centeredness that is being pushed constantly in the media, you know, that, that, that you're only supposed to look out for yourself. That is only your life equals how much stuff you own. What do you buy? What kind of car do you have? How much bling do you have? How much, imp, you know, all of these different things that we are told are what your value is. And to have a story that counters that and says your values, your value is your values to a certain extent. Your value is the impact you have on the humans around you, not on what you can buy them or how much you can impress them. And, you're and I think that that's together a- too, yeah. right? Human, like, like I love how you say, like the television, the movies; these are so well crafted. And when you walk into a theater, this is these this is live people. You could be up there on the stage, and this is this is their craft, and this is their art. I mean, sorry, the thing you love on. about oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I love how it's like the the feeling of um, when you walk into a theater, um, it, you're seeing that performance. No one else is going to see that performance. You're going to see that performance that night and how it, you know, and even though everything is like, is rehearsed, there will be moments. It will breathe. We'll all be together. It's a conversation between the audience and the actors on stage, really. And um, Z Space is wonderful. It's huge. It's like there's there's not going to be a bad seat in the house. Um, it's uh, got a, a beautiful, like tiered audience and a big space. So it feel, will feel very expansive in there. But you'll get to breathe with them. We're all breathing like the same air. We're we're talking. We're hearing. We're the audit. The actors on stage hear you, 
hear you breathe, hear you laugh, um, hear you rustle in your seat if you're, you know, feeling antsy. So it is a relationship. It's a conversation. And so that shared space is something that's extremely special in theater because tomorrow it'll be a different show. It'll be the same words, but it always is a little different. And so that is the magic of it for me. And then it will disappear, right? It's like a magic moment we all shared together in a circle. Like, like if we, you know, went somewhere and then the net and then it's gone. And so it lives inside of your memory and it lives inside of your experience. And, um, and so that is really, I think the magic of being in, in the space and Z space is wonderful because it has the capability to do some of the aerial that other places do not have. There's, you can't walk into any theater and be able to have a 16 foot ladder fly in from the ceiling. Okay. <laughs> So, um, well, magic. And, and you guys, because now we're onto this part of our program, I am so excited. I think we're going to actually go, we're going to zoom in over to the theater and meet some of the actors that are rehearsing at this time. I can set it up if you'd like. It's just, um, you'll see, uh, three of our actors are going to read a little bit of, um, from the script as they're rehearsing the lines and, um, and kind of working out some character things so that's what hopefully you're going to get a chance to see well they need another minute so maybe oh. you can tell us a little, a little <laughs> sure well and what are we going to see tonight um we will see um our um uh little we all the bettys have we joke around we're like little betty married betty um and betty betty we call her betty betty it's current day betty we call betty betty <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you're going to see those three actors, um, uh, reading a little bit from the, um, basically, um, married Betty explaining who she fell in love with and her first husband. Oh, great. We're excited. And I think we're ready to go. Hi. Um, what's up everyone? So excited to be here with you all today. My name is Aida, and I'll be uh, playing Mary Betty. I am Andrea Brimbury, and I am playing Betty Betty. <laughs> oh, Betty. <laughs> and I'm Tiara. I will be Little Betty. Yeah. And one fun thing to know uh, about our, our play, which you'll see more clearly in, in person, um, is, uh, is that Betty takes on uh, other characters in her life and uh, will play not just herself, but other people. So you'll, you'll see, you'll, you'll catch on. Should we jump, Should we, are we ready? Yeah. Don't tell me, I get married just because I'm lonely. I was not lonely. I was in love. Yeah. <sighs> Hi, my name is Melvin. I didn't know how special the reeds were until I met Mel. My family has been in California since before the Civil War. We're founding members of the Third Baptist Church over in San Francisco, one of the most important churches on the West Coast. One of his cousins wrote the We Charge Genocide speech. What's gen aside? It's when one group of people try to kill off another group of people. The speech said that's what the United States was doing to Negroes. And it and it was read to the General Assembly of the United Nations by Mr. Paul Robeson. Mel's cousin was also a communist and even visited the Soviet Union. With Mr. Paul Robeson. Mel was a big star in college football, baseball, basketball. With Mr. Paul Robeson. Don't be smart. But Daddy didn't approve of Mel. Why not? Daddy always said he didn't want his daughter carrying no coal. But I thought you said he played football. Did he also work for a coal company? Not that kind of coal. He meant inside of me. How do you carry coal inside yourself? Not literally a lump of coal. He meant if me and a dark-skinned boy liked each other very, very much and we become close, real close. Oh. You mean like if you had sex, got pregnant, and we're going to have a dark-skinned baby? Uh, well, <sighs> yes. Why didn't you just say that? 
da Daddy was old fashioned Creole, and he didn't want any grandbabies darker than him. But Mel is tall, dark, smart, handsome, and passionate about life. And I love him. I loved him. That's, that, that's what you <laughs> get for now. Yeah, <laughs> so we're so excited for you all to come out and see the show March 29th. Wow. Just a little sneak peek. <laughs> That's great. And I'm I'm so excited now just to see see what they look like and who they are. A little bit of their characters, get to know them. And I'm so excited to um, come and see them break out into sound and song. Um, I, know. I wish we could have given you a little bit of, uh, of uh, music, but we have a couple of um, there's so many songs, too. So I, I think that you'll really enjoy that kind of span. Um, a lot of different eras um, and to kind of help us tell the time period. But really, Betty just like dug into like a beautiful jazz. Um, jazz was really her like, and folk were like her heart and in the period she was writing. And so that little clip that you just, a uh, little bit that you um, saw was kind of talking about what Michael was talking about, about the colorism and about um being Creole and people trying to protect that that group of people. Um, and then Betty coming to realize that she didn't really care. She, you know, wanted this, this person was important to her. And, um, and so she married Mel who, um, who she was with for 30, who she was married to for 35 years. So. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things you saw that they mentioned in that is that because when I, when I got the idea of having different different actors play Betty at different ages, and and one of the things that I always felt like, you know, when you see a film and there's like the flashback part, you see the person, the character, or a play, you see a character as a young person, and then that young person, that actor leaves, and somebody else comes in, and you're supposed to transfer all of the feelings you had for that young character to their older version. When we did the first workshop of the show, and I and I wrote the first scene of it. And I was like, oh, and then let young, little Betty leaves. And I thought, mm, I'm going to miss little Betty. If little Betty isn't there, I'm going to miss her. And so I accept extending how long she was on stage. And then I was like, wait a minute. Instead of having a bunch of other characters, every time a Betty comes in, she stays. And they play everybody else in Betty's life also. So Betty will be playing, you know, Ranger Betty. And then she will play, play Mel for a moment in a scene. And then she goes back to being Ranger Betty. They all play all of these parts so that it's really like Betty is this world of experiences that she's having in different parts of her playing all of these different people that she's known. Yeah, it's, I can, we, and we saw a little glimpse of that, right? Yeah. And it was like Mel, and, and it just works so beautifully. And I like how the, the young is talking to the old, which I can, and they're all like the, the two, they're trying to educate the, the the young one, and then the young one's like, "Ah, why didn't you just say it that way?" Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, this is, you know, we can take questions from the from the audience. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to read it, and we can spend a little bit of time on that. Um, otherwise, we can continue to to talk. If there's any questions out there, please just write them in the chat. Like Elizabeth was saying, Betty wrote, wrote so many interesting songs that are some of them are, are so inspiring and so almost ethereal. And some of them are so gut wrenching and passionate. And we had to go through when we were when I was figuring out where in the show to put the songs. One of the big things we were very fortunate to have uh, 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 Daniel Savio and Angie Doctor both work. We worked together to find the songs that worked best in places, but also to uh, uh, re to orchestrate them, as Elizabeth was saying, to tell the time period, to take a song that Betty wrote very jazzy and go, okay, this song has to take place in the 20s now. How do we figure that out? That's some of the quality of how you make a play. You know, this song, yes, she wrote the song in 1972, but it's perfect for what her character's going through in 1945. So we have to redo it as a big band number. You know, and we've got a wonderful band that we've been working with and the orchestrations of all of the pieces, taking things that Betty wrote for one voice and a guitar and then 
orchestrating it and creating all of these harmonies so the Bettys can sing together and create these big, beautiful numbers that uh, that really I think really will hit the audience in a way to see that both the depth of the feeling that she had, but also kind of the soaring of the aspiration of how she thought the world could be. Wow. Oh, okay. We uh, that is that is very cool, and it makes it even more more exciting. All right, here's here's a question. Well, first of all, greetings from New York City. Thanks for letting us in on the creative process. And will there be a way to access the full production on streaming at some point? Yes. So yeah. There will. And I think the best way is to go to sfbacco.com and you'll get a pop-up to join their newsletter. You should you should put your email in and then you're going to be getting getting the updates. Um, here's another question. Which Betty do you both resonate most with? Elizabeth hmm. first. You know, uh, oh, I think, okay, if I was really just to say off the cuff, first answer is Revolutionary Betty. Um, I went to Mills College um, here in the Bay Area. That's how I came to the Bay Area. So um, I am very proud women's college uh, graduate. And when I was there, I did a lot of, um, I, I did a lot of social justice work and we're, and we're not talking like last year, I'm old, you know, I've been around for a while. So I helped divest, um, Mills college from, uh, South Africa. Um, I was part of the, um, the strike, uh, in 92, um, keeping Mills women's college and affirming, uh, women's education, that was, there was no damage to the campus, but we shut down the campus for 17 days. Um, we also looked at, uh, um, uh, uh, recidivism rate, not recidivism, sorry, the wrong word, um, uh, retention rates of, uh, students of color, um, mm -hmm. also like, uh, professors of color. And then that kind of bled out into other areas of my life. And so, I think I was always a little bit that person, even when I was in high school. I'm I'm around for when there was the first MLK Day. Um, uh, I, you know, did a we used to do a march for MLK, and then you know, so like there were just all of these moments, and I'm like, oh, I think it's actually Revolutionary Betty, and I'm not like the person who's maybe always right out on the front, but I've always been involved. I've always been doing it. And it's really a part of who I am and how I see the world. And then there are other parts. I'm a mom. I'm a tw I have a 12 year old. Yeah. And that part is also like being a, a professional, you know, a professional woman in the arts and balancing those things is huge. But if I were to ask me my first hit, I think it's actually Revolutionary Betty is like where my heart kind of like kind of jumps in. So there you go. <laughs> what about you, Michael? Well, interestingly, yeah, the first thing that came to mind was also Revolutionary Betty because of my background and, and you know, power to the people and we got to overthrow capitalism and all that. Uh, but when I think about it, for me, in a way, all of the Bettys are Revolutionary Betty. You know, uh, there. I mean, in a way, they're all all of them. That's the thing is that little Betty is revolutionary yes. in that in how she sees the world. Uh, married Betty, who moves out, you know, to Walnut Creek and thinks that she's going to be able to change this new suburb and make and change the school system and change the people around her to see the world as a better place and not this little white enclave. And then from that, she starts becoming, uh, you know, going to protests. And then she becomes Revolutionary Betty in the play. But then from Revolutionary Betty, she goes on to become Ranger Betty, who, and, uh, you know, who wants to change all of Sacramento Street, to change Richmond, to help the people who are, who are uh, the working class folks whose parents stayed in Richmond after the war when everybody moved away, um, that she is, all of them are revolutionary. And I think that's one of the, one of the great things about her life is that it is constant, that the striving for change, striving to something better, always having the question of how could this be better is part of every aspect of her life throughout the her life yeah. and throughout the show. Um, did Betty have a sneak peek at the script during any point of its creation? <laughs> and yes, what did she did. say about it? 
I was so happy when we did the uh, the first part. I was saying I wrote the first like first scene and I was kind of struggling with it and trying to figure it out. And so I wrote the first scene and they uh, Batco put it up at their new works festival and Betty came. I was I was so happy. Diara, uh, her daughter uh, and Betty came out to the show. They came into the Mission District in San Francisco and Betty was sitting in the back. Nobody knows. She, I didn't know she was there, you know, in, in, and um, after we finished the performance, then they said, and Betty Reed Soskin is here. And I was like, oh, great. What is she going to say? <laughs> I was like, this could be really bad. And she just, and she loved it. She was, uh, my job as a playwright, especially with somebody's life, but even when I'm adapting other people's work, is to try to do it in such a way that it sounds like something they would have written, sounds like something they would have said, that they're not um, appalled by it, but that I've found something in them that maybe they didn't in there that they didn't necessarily think about, but at the same time, when they see it, they go, that does resonate for them. And she was like, yes, that works for me. And about a year after that, after I'd finished the whole script, we did a reading that was way too long. And she was just like, okay, this part's kind of confusing. And I ha I was trying to put so many things in at this one section in the second act. And after she was like, yeah, that seems a little, well, and I was like, you're absolutely right. And I, just, and I found a way to tell like all of that stuff in like two sentences. So, so she's been so very cool. helpful. You know, I, and it goes back to what Elizabeth said at the beginning, which is like, here you are, you have written a play, you are, you know, going live on this play on March 29th, and the person is in the room. Um, and like, like you said, well, usually, you know, maybe it's characters that have, you know, been from history or, or before or they're fictional characters but this is a real person that actually sits in the room and has something to say and and she's sophisticated because mm -hmm. I think naturally as humans we're very self-critical or when someone is putting putting us like putting a mirror up to us maybe we are not comfortable or we you know shy away from it but no of course that's not Betty Betty is able to um, to relate and to be open with sharing who she is. And I think that's that's the gift that we have with Betty Reed Soskin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, I'm I'm going to I'm going to close this kind of question and answer area and we're going to be um, sort of rounding out our program. But I just want to say that in the in this feed of questions and answers, there's a lot of love for you both. Um, you, you've been called gifts tonight. Um, they, people are just so excited and congratulate you. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And it's so fun to get to meet the playwright and the director. Oh, thank you for having us. Oh, I noticed also in the, in the, in the chat, someone asked if all of the songs are by Betty and yes. There's one song out of all of the, actually, out of all of the songs that are in the play, one of them is a poem that Betty loved, uh, uh, Renaissance, which is, or Renaissance, um, which is an Edna St. Vincent Millay poem that we had, to, that Daniel Savio, our, uh, uh, who wrote additional music, he wrote music for that. And then there's one song that Betty wrote that she never recorded and can't, couldn't remember the music to. So Daniel had to come up with music for that. But besides that, all, besides that poem, all the lyrics are by Betty. And besides that one song, uh, those two songs, all the music is by Betty. Different versions of it. Like if you see it, there'll be a, like I said, there's a song at one point, but then there's a dance number at another point in the show that uses the same music, but in a different style. Over here, it's jazz and over here, it's big band and over here, it's folk. And then something else over here is more, you know, Melody line. Uh, a waltz. Yeah. So so every it's kind of like uh, uh, variations of Betty's music throughout the show. Yes. yes. You you know what you guys? Um, I can feel the how proud you are of this project, how excited you are, and um, we're just so excited to be able to support you. And um, and you know, this is going to be so much fun. I'm so excited to come. Well, thank you so much for having us. It's Can't such a great to opportunity to share. <laughs> And um, I hope all of you out there who are listening and watching will not just bring yourselves, but bring another person with you so you can talk about it afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, okay, so what's happening is 
we're we're gonna continue on with these teasers or a teaser of the the play on March 22nd. So in exactly mm -hmm. one month, we're having um, Rosie the Riveter Trust is hosting a pop up event, and that's going to be at the Ford Building right next to the National Park Visitor Center. It's a Friday night. I think it's six o'clock and we'll get you the details. After this, we're going to be sending an email out with all the information and all the links. But we're we're planning to have Betty's son and wife come and sing one of her songs mm -hmm. and then have some the some of the cast come and be there live for us to actually see one of the scenes and perhaps one of the songs. And then we also have the the film, the the producers of the film that are gonna come and show the documentary and not the documentary, wow. but sorry, the, a trailer. And then we all are going to have a glass of wine or a glass of mineral water and we get to hang out together. And that's really um, right before, it's the week before, before the show and you'll be able to buy tickets there, but that's a free event and um, if anyone's interested in coming and it's right where the ferry from San Francisco lets you off, it's very convenient. Um, look forward to you signing up for that. Um, the second thing is we will be promoting um, a code, a, a promo code for you so that you can get a significant discount off of the tickets. And that's kind of every day of the week, except for Thursdays, which are an already discounted day for anyone that wants to come see the musical. And then on, I think it's March 31st, I think it's Easter Sunday, we'll have an event, um, it's, we're kind of calling it the, the, the National Park Rosie Day. And you know, if, if by chance you wanna come on that day, I think that's the day I'm gonna go. Um, and, and we'll be there in the theater together, just celebrating Betty. How does that sound? I'll be there. Oh, okay. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> well, look forward to shaking your hand at that time. Um, okay, now I want to, I'm so excited to also introduce this short trailer. We're gonna round out the night. I'm gonna, I just wanna tell you about it. And then we're gonna turn off our cameras and my colleague, Molly Fagan, she's gonna come on. She's not coming on, but she's gonna show us the trailer and we're gonna end the night. But this is something also that we're very excited to promote. Um, it's a forthcoming documentary. They are finishing it up. They're doing a crowd fundraising right now and we will supply the links. It's called Sign My Name to Freedom. And so it's the same name, but it is been a documentary that for years they have been putting this together. So where's the play re re reinterprets Betty's music through its cast in a live band, the film will be the first time Betty shares her original catalog of songs from the 1960s. And it will introduce people to her remarkable work as a singer with a style that evokes Billie Holiday mixed with Joan Baez. Can you imagine, mm. by the way? I love them both. The documentary follows Betty's journey from listening to her music for the first time in 50 years after hiding it away on reel-to-reel -reel tapes in the back of her closet to singing one of her songs again before an audience of thousands backed by a full symphony orchestra and a 200-person choir. Wow. In addition, the project will release an album of her lost songs for the first time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for bringing Betty to, to the stage and to our lives. Betty Reed Soskin, if you're listening, you are a gift. We thank you, we love you. And without further ado, here is the trailer to end out the night. And just wanna say thank you so much from Rosie the Riveter Trust. Thank you, thank you for having us. And good night. Bye-bye. We go through life knowing that we could die at any point especially now that I'm 95. Time now is finite. And having my younger self emerge in these years catches me sort of off balance. I'm being asked to retrace my steps. I've lived many lives. I've been many women over time. Part of my identity is still mother. Another part of my life, I was that black merchant down on Sacramento Street. I was a political activist. And that was all before I became 
a park ranger at the age of 85. I want tips from Betty on how I can look that good at 94. But beyond the uniform, beyond the public self, there is that Betty who's left behind. Betty the artist, Betty the musician. I packed secret Betty up in boxes in reel-to-reel -reel tapes. No one in my life knew that I had been a singer or that I had written music. The song I wrote most recently, after watching the television coverage of the raids on the Panther headquarters in Chicago and in Los Angeles. Little boy black, little boy black, city streets calling my little boy back. I talk about you know, suffering a mental break, but I don't give anybody the reasons why. But the music saved me. It really did. Lonely boy, little boy, black. We were the first family of color in Walnut Creek. It was a tumultuous period. I spent the next five, ten years in kind of awfulness of rejection, becoming the object of ridicule and hostility. And I became suicidal. And it was after that that I began to remember music. And I finally realized that I was not remembering songs at all, but that these were songs that were coming from me. They were all autobiographical. I was documenting all of those events that we were experiencing as a country, and that I was experiencing in isolation. But they ring as true for me now as I did when I wrote them. Your hand in mine. The simple sign of love. That was something I wrote for the church. We span the miles. We wear the smiles born of sharing this day. An Your aging, mature Betty is now hearing young Betty singing rather amazing poetry that is so far beyond what I thought I had produced in those years. She was brought out of hiding by the making of this film. I feel like I want to be whole and I want my artist self to join with my activist self because they're all the same person. Maybe this releasing of the music to the public is a way of making myself whole. And maybe I need to do that before I die. Thank you.